All right, we're getting close to 305. Thanks everyone for joining today on the uh, NDSA infrastructure interest group uh, call. Uh, today, uh, Lee Prescott will be facilitating a panel discussion about different um, in infrastructure at different size institutions and you know, small, medium and large. Um, we'll have a little, a couple, um, actually one of these I think needs to come off, um, but we'll have a few other business items at the end of the presentation and uh, anyone of course can, can bring up um, anything else they want to talk about. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Hit, oh, I cannot, uh, I cannot record myself, so we will have to go with the clear recording. Um, but uh, Lee, uh, if you want to take over the screen control, um, we should be able to get started. Thanks, everyone. All right, let me see if I can. Yeah, I think I can. Do this. Let's see. It sounds like uh, someone um, is on the phone but not muted. It'd help if uh, everyone who wasn't actively speaking was muted. Okay. So, can any can you see my first slide? Just says turn them off. I sent Cynthia an email just to let her know. She's going to be surprised. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. So, Nathan, can you see my Georgetown Law slide? Yes. Yes, we can, Lee. Okay. Um, let me get out of the screen here. See what I mean? Okay. So, um, this is going to be probably a little bit of a whirlwind. Um, so, what we're trying to do is to uh, cover five different organizations. And you can build right next starting to from Georgetown Law, Law, which represents the, the, the smallest institution of all of them, yeah. and to try to get a sense of how it applies. The guy said he'd leave the openings open for a couple of days. Um, but he said, can Ed, could you mute, please? Because we can't both right now with that sidewalk. Uh, so once that sidewalk's done, they will open see. it up. So Nathan, I think you can do it. Up here, doesn't look like I can mute them that. myself. Hmm. That's good. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll keep going. No, uh, I. Sorry about this, everyone. Um, so I'm going to start with with Georgetown. I'm going to talk just a little bit about what we're doing, and then I'm also going to talk about a project that we're doing using Preservica because there was interest in Preservica. Um, and actually, just to let you know, the other institutions that we'll be hearing from are uh, the Getty Research Institute, um, the Smithsonian, um, the National Archives, and AP Trust. So just to give context for Georgetown Law. Uh, what we are doing, uh, overarching goal, is to literally digitize the entire library. That's our, our director's goal. And um, this is in service of a, of a project we're doing to, um, to digitize and lend all of our materials. So we're doing a um, controlled digital lending project, which is what it's called. Uh, so we're digitizing our general collection books. We're digitizing microfilm and microfiche, um, special collections materials. The microfilm and microfiche and the general collection books are in production mode at this point. With special collections and archival materials, you know, we're doing it on a more uh, selected basis as things are needed. Um, we're also doing all of our law journals. So we have 13 uh, student-run law journals, and they're all being digitized as well. Um, and on top of the, uh, the materials we're actually digitizing, we are also, of course, gathering born digital materials. So um, our um, communications office has just transferred all of uh, uh, the photographs from however long over here. So there, and many of them are born digital. Uh, oral histories that we're conducting, they're um, being done digitally now. Uh, AV, some of the AV, the legacy AV, we are outsourcing the digitization of, and we're, of course, now getting uh, new materials in digital form. Uh, Law Center records coming over, again, manuscript materials, usually a combination of digital and born digital, and we are using Archivit to crawl our web pages, and we're hoping to start to crawl our intranet soon. Um, so the Again, the idea is that even though Georgetown law doesn't represent um, 
probably the most beginning stages of digital preservation, which you know, would literally be saving uh, digital materials on fixed media like CDs and things like that. We're not doing that. We are uh, actually storing to um, spinning media, but, um, but we're still pretty basic in what we're doing. We're using Bagot. Uh, we first, we used the Java Bagot library, now Python. Uh, we created a little Python script to read directories and run through and bag them so that uh, we have some level of an automated process for creating Bagot. Uh, we miss Bagot bag in place, which maybe that's changed. We haven't looked at the Python library recently, but that's one difference between the Python library and the Java library is you can't do bag in place, which um, we really did a lot of before. Uh, the reason we're using Python, however, is that we're using Python for other processes, so it's easier to just put everything into Python. We currently have a university uh, data center share, which is uh, 36 terabytes. We're using about 31 terabytes at this point, so we're getting to the point where we'll have to request more, at which point we will possibly be told that we will need to move off of the university data center. They're in the process of moving a lot of things to uh, servers on AWS, so we're just kind of waiting until uh, that's what we have to do as well. Right now, they don't charge us a ton of money, so it's advantageous for us to stay as long as we can on the university, in the university data center, um, but that will end at some point in time. Uh, right now, we're using a human process to get our files into our 36 terabyte share, primarily a human process. We'd like to ramp that up to some more automated process. Um, and the, uh, uni the, the university's UIS, our um, infrastructure, our IT department for the university um, backs up the files, but, they're, but I don't know what the geographic dispersion of those, of those backups are. Um, and we are separate from the main campus. We're geographically separate. We are uh, organizationally separate. And um, our main campus is using AP Trust. As, I, as I'm describing, we, we are not. So um, we are using Fixity to validate our files on the um, what we're calling the Z drive, which is that 36 terabytes. Um, our backups from our UIS department are only available for 30 days, so uh, we need to schedule our fixity accordingly. Uh, one of the things that doesn't mesh is that fixity creates its own manif manifest, so even though we're creating Bagot manifests, fixity doesn't, isn't using them, so a minor, minor issue. Um, we also keep materials at the Internet Archive as part of this controlled digital lending project. Uh, so we do think of that as one of our geographic areas because it's in California. Uh, so that gives us some level of protection in terms of ge geography. Uh, we also have a DSpace repository that we share with main campus, but we don't really look at that as a preservation repository. The other project that I wanted to talk about is the Legal Information Archive, which is a, um, it was started as a pilot called the Chesapeake Project um, with the Maryland State Law Library, the Virginia State Law Library, and Harvard, although Harvard uh, has not participated in a while, so whether they will move to Preservica or not, I'm not sure. Um, this has become a program of the Legal Information Preservation Alliance, or LIPA, uh, and we are in the process now of moving from uh, ContentDM, where it has been, to Preservica. And we are actually the first uh, consortial customer for Preservica, so uh, we will, uh, there are, will be kinks, I'm sure, that we will have to work out. Uh, Preservica offers two tenancy um, programs. One is a shared tenancy where all of the consortium shares a single Preservica. You can also get a multi-tenancy where it's basically a, a, a purchasing discount for, for going in together as a, consor as a consortium. 
Uh, I just wanted to quickly show uh, some of the basics of Preservica. So um, you can have a number of collections in Preservica and um, as you can see, you can um, save various kinds of metadata and I actually had a, let's see if I can bring it up here quickly. So this is our Preservica instance. Uh, if I open training that I just did this morning, you can see sort of the basics of what, what you see in Preservica. Um, there's technical metadata, um, the various uh, audit trail. Of course, I just did this this morning, so that's all there is. And then uh, you can get a um, report that will print out all of it. And I'm not going to take the time at this point to, to show you, but you can get a report that will uh, print out, will we'll export everything out, as well as give you a report of all of the, the status of everything that has happened to that digital object. Um, so these are the, the kinds of activities that Preservica will do to, um, to preserve your digital objects. Fixity checking, it will self-heal, does characterization of file format using Jove and Droid and a, a number of engines. Um, you can ingest standard metadata um, and as well as adding your own schema if you want, does virus checking, it has granular permissions, and it's built on top of AWS uh, storage. We will be implementing universal access. We haven't gotten there yet. We're still at the very beginning of the process. Um, Reservica offers the ability to create virtual collections, so you can um, create something that uh, for a, an exhibit. It, you can do web harvesting with Preservica, um, and we will need to ingest ARC files that, uh, that came out of ContentDM. I'm in the process of figuring that all out. Um, I know that you can ingest email, although I have not done anything relating to that yet. Uh, you can ingest it, uh, video, and as I mentioned, you can ingest your own XML schemas. So that's a, a fast look at um, both what we're doing at Georgetown Law and this new Preservica project that we're working on. So Teresa, if you're ready to go, I'm going to stop sharing and you can sh uh, start sharing. And uh, this is Teresa Solo from the Getty Research Institute. Yeah, so let me see if I can share my Are you able to see the, yeah, there we go, share screen. Yeah. Seeing my slides. Are you able to see my slides? I'm able, I only see a screen. Can anybody else see slides? I'm only seeing a blue. No, I see sort of a gray, a gray yeah. screen. Do you have multiple screen? Do you have multiple monitors? No. Sometimes it's easier to, instead of sharing a screen, share a specific program. If you um, unshare and then go back in, you should see an option just to share PowerPoint, for example. How about now? Yes. That work? Looks good. Thanks. Okay, great. Okay, so um, as Leah said, I'm Teresa Solo from the Getty Research Institute, and uh, um, I'm going to do a quick uh, some information about our digital projects and digital preservation here. Um, so GRI is in LA. It's one of the four programs of the J. Paul Getty Trust. Um, and we have a special collections and, and research library of, of rare materials and digital resources that serve an international community of scholars and the interested public focusing on visual arts. Um, 
we've been live with Rosetta, which is an Ex Libris product since June of 2013, so about five years. Uh, and we're active participants in the Rosetta Working Group, which we're actually hosting here at the Getty uh, this June, and that's an, an annual meeting that we have with uh, other Rosetta customers. Um, right now, we have over 2, 2.3 million files, um, which are um, packaged in 32,000 complex digital objects and it's about 230 terabytes in size. Um, and this, uh, our digital repository that we have on, on site, it doesn't include any of our digitized books. Those we've due to the Internet Archive and our preservation copies are at the Hadi Trust. So um, this 230 terabytes is everything else. So that's photographs, drawings, correspondence, prints, um, audio and video, as well as our, our born digital content. Um, to give you a sense of our team and, uh, and the kind of collections we have, um, uh, we're kind of we're kind of dispersed. Um, I would say maybe a quarter of my job. I'm the head of library systems and digital services. About a quarter of my job is spent um, on digital preservation, digital collections. We've got a systems librarian who supports four systems. One of them is Rosetta, and then we have um, three library assistants that are dedicated to combining the metadata. Uh, about the digitized and the born digital material with the actual files and depositing those into our into Rosetta. Uh, and then we also have two digital archivists, one in institutional archives and one in special collections that are working mostly with born digital materials. And of course, there's lots of associated staff um, in rights and central IT manages our storage. Obviously, lots of people making metadata um, and, and doing project planning and the like. Um, we just started depositing our born digital content. I guess it's been a year and a half now. We, we have all, all under one terabyte at this point, but that's quite a few files considering a lot of the born digital content are you know, Word files, Excel, things very small individual files. Um, and mostly it's institutional business records, but special collections materials are now being deposited as well, uh, born digital materials. And then, as I was saying before, we've got um, the majority of our content is digitized from our physical collections. A um, little more information about the workflows. Um, for digitization, uh, any audio and video that needs to be seen by researchers has to be reformatted beforehand. So um, we do that. We do mass digitization projects with external funding or internal funding. We've got a, pro a process where researchers can request individual items to be digitized, digitization on demand. And um, we get all of our descriptive metadata from our library catalog, Alma, or archive space, which is where our archival descriptions reside. And then we map it into Dublin Core um, and combine that uh, with other information to create a METS file, which then gets deposited into Rosetta. Um, Rosetta is also our digital access system, so those that those items that should be accessible to end users need to then be published to Primo, which is our discovery layer, and then people can access them online through our digital collections. Um, for born digital, um, trust records, generally we're only putting them in for preservation, not for access. It's possible that we'll provide access to individual departments that need access to their files, but it's not um, meant as a kind of an access system for those files. Um, and we're using a different process to get those in, a CSV file, um, and uh, Rosetta allows us to maintain the folder structure. So like if we've gotten a hard drive or something from someone and it's got a lot of directories and subdirectories, we can kind of reconstruct that same hierarchy in Rosetta uh, once we've deposited it. So the, the end user can, or the, the, the owner of the files can then see the files kind of in their same structure. Um, a lot of the same features that Leo was talking about for Preservica, um, there's in Rosetta, there's something called the validation stack, which does these things. It um, calculates or verifies a checksum. It identifies file formats using Droid um, and Pronom, the file format registry. Uh, it can extract technical metadata from many different file formats using Jove or many other metadata extractors are kind of being added over time. 
can do a virus check and it does something called risk assessment, which is where we can say whether we decide certain files are risky for whatever reason. Um, as with most, uh, any preservation system, it's got an audit trail and, and provenance events for anything that happens to the files over time. And you can always revert back to earlier versions. A um, couple more uh, in terms of access, it's got 10 different viewers. It's got robust access rights and retention periods. So far, we haven't hit any limits on size or number of files. So we've got some intellectual entities, some, some digital objects that have upwards of 30,000 files um, and even, even TIFFs, um, so a significantly sized object, maybe six or seven terabytes for a single digital object. And we've also got some where an individual file can be very large if it's a video or something. So. Um, and then finally, the exit strategy is pretty clear. Um, the data is all stored as MES files with absolute file paths. So that allows us to actually kind of reconstruct the database if we need to in the future. And I think this is my last slide. Uh, okay, so our file streams are stored in um, a Keystar system, hierarchical, hierarchical storage management. And the files that are used regularly, the access files are staying on spinning media but all the preservation level files are stored on tape. We've got three copies, one on-site, one off-site, and um, Amazon S3. So um, that, I think, gives you a <laughs> quick tour uh, of, of our infrastructure here. Yeah, as I said, whirlwind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think next we had Leslie Johnson from uh, the National Archives. Are you there, Leslie? I saw your name. I know you're there. Yeah, I am here. Sorry, I was. I accidentally muted myself, and I'm trying to get myself out of my two monitor mode. <laughs> and let me see. Desktop one. Share screen. All right. Can you see it? Not yet. One. Does it? Not yet. Does you have? Sorry. There we go. Now again. Okay. Let me get, sorry, it also wants me to change my color scheme, apparently. All right, yes? Yep. All right, so. We're seeing you in present presenter mode, but I don't think. You're, 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 I think you're gonna get stuck with that because yeah, it's, it's being fine. confused within yep. the dual monitor. I do have dual 4K monitors and it gets confused easily. Yeah, Nathan was having the same problem at the very beginning. So I say go with yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna go with it. Yep. So. Um, we have two separate preservation units at NARA, and we are administratively separate in different areas of the agency, um, reporting up to different executives. So we have a long-standing preservation unit that deals with our physical collections, and we have a basically brand spanking new digital preservation unit, which right now the entirety of that unit is me. Wow. Um, I came here four years ago to be the director of digital preservation. There were some other priorities at the time. I ended up focusing on infrastructure for three years, and now I have been set back on the path of dealing um, solely with digital preservation, which means we're in an interesting place in our planning and undertaking. So a lot of our role as a federal agency is to provide guidance to all the other federal agencies. So for us, it's very much a life cycle um, activity because we actually provide the guidance to agencies which agencies must abide by when they transfer their records to us for preservation and which we as a federal agency must also abide by in turning our own records over to ourselves, something we have never done the same way twice. So. Our digital preservation strategy went live uh, almost exactly a year ago, June 10th of 2017, to guide our internal operations. And that document is publicly accessible. And this is outlining all the specific strategies 
that we'll use in our preservation efforts. So our infrastructure, how we handle data integrity, how we deal with format and media sustainability. And because we are a federal agency, and this is very important to our operations, information security. So our holdings, I mean, there was a question earlier as to whether we were the largest organization or not. In one way we might be, um, we have over 40 locations across the country, which includes the presidential libraries. Um, this is the, for the permanent records of the federal government, which only comes out to three, at most 5% of any of the items created by any federal agencies during their daily work. And we have multiple regulations that control us, primarily the Federal Records Act for federal agencies and the Presidential Records Act, which covers the White House and its federal components. So that means that we get records from over 200 agencies and we actually received, we're on now the 50th anniversary of our first electronic records transfer. We actually got our first transfer in 1968. So we are very excited and trying to discover how we should celebrate this since this is really actually only exciting to about five of us. Um, we have 1.47 billion files in the holdings right now. And because we have gotten those over the course of 50 years, we have over 600 variants of file formats, uh, textual, email, audio, video, still image, GIS, databases, data sets, system exports, uh, primarily from White House systems, websites, social media. Our single largest file type right now is email. We have over, we have, I think it's 470 million email messages right now. Um, a lot of that is presidential. Um, a lot of the federal email hasn't yet hit their scheduled dissemination time to hit us, but it's coming soon. Uh, we have unclassified and classified records. So classified is an interesting information security issue for us. Um, and as of December 2022, we will no longer accept any paper records from other agencies, which is starting an interesting scramble with agencies they're all primarily born digital now, but that means they have paper records that they've been holding on to to transfer to us or are in our federal record centers. They'll need to be digitized. And of course, we have digitization projects. We have mass digitization projects, such as with um, Family Search and Ancestry and other organizations. So we have multiple systems right now. Um, we have our electronic records archive system, which went into service in 2009. Uh, we have APS, which runs the workflow to read tapes. Tapes are still the primary official transfer media, according to the federal regulation, not in reality, but we still need to run a system to take in nine track tapes. Uh, I have four nine track, track tape systems that I run. Um, we have Amos that logs our ingest and processing. We have Eric that validates structured data. That's a lot of what we get. Uh, DAS, our descriptive um, system for creating metadata, and the National Archives Catalog, which delivers records to the public. That was one of the first of our systems to go onto the cloud. Uh, we are cloud first in the federal government, so we are now in the process of moving as everything that we can into cloud systems. So. We have a number of assumptions in our system functionality. Um, we provide transfer guidance to agencies. The records we get should conform to the transfer guidance. In reality, of course, they don't. If an agency is producing work in a format that's not one of the approximately 60 formats we expect, we do still take it. Um, they must have recorded fixities if they, when they come to us, if possible. If not, we create them in the system. Um, we, of course, track all actions. We retain them exactly as they are received, but we do make public use copies that go into our catalog. So a lot of PDFs, um, a lot of uh, JPEGs. Um, we are not doing preservation format transformations on ingest, but we are going to be. And we do do annual audits. Uh, we currently do sample audits. Uh, we're getting ready to switch to um, more regular audits than that. Uh, I think this is probably, we do now have a digital preservation advisory group that works with me on all of our internal activities. 
Um, we ingest from every type of media you can imagine now, including network transfers. People send them as email attachments. Um, so we do fixities, we run validation checks. We're primarily a droid shop rather than a joke shop. Um, we create manifests. We do annual sampling of the media that we keep in the collections because agencies do send some media to us like the White House and we do keep those and then do migrations on them as per certain regulations. And then we have ongoing system monitoring and we do do annual COOP um, continuity of operations backup restoration tests for the entire system. And that entire system is actually about to change. So we are now developing our ERE 2.0 system. We are actually going to be going live in August. Um, this has been, the original system was developed, custom developed for us by Lockheed Martin. Anyone can go back and read the Washington Post articles about how that went for us. This time we have been working with IBM. It has been a wonderful collaboration using almost entirely an open source stack. Uh, this is being developed in AWS as our development platform and for our production platform, although we'd be using the GovCloud version of AWS. So we are using all AWS and open source systems, although we're having to stick build them because of the security protocols. We need to run everything in our own AWS enclave rather than do calls to their systems that they host and their services. Um, this required us to set up a number of different aspects of the system, one for processing, uh, one for indexing, um, and one for um, working with the files. This is entirely virtualized, so all the archivists have their own virtual machines and they operate in the cloud where the files live. So we are never moving the files. We are operating almost entirely with logical controls rather than physical controls. Files don't move. Uh, we're still trying to figure out how to do this with agencies. Um, it's not a technical challenge. It's actually a regulatory challenge. If they have their records um, under contract in a particular cloud provider, provider, we can't just take over their contract. So this has been an interesting challenge for us that has nothing to do with the technology. So we'll have our processing environment up in August. And this is a mix of commercial and open source tools, some thin client, some thick client, uh, because of the tools that we need for certain types of processing. Um, our repository, which is um, fully content searchable, but also has very granular access controls um, because we do also have sensitive records like census, which we have to put close hold on for 70 years, or congressional records, which are close hold for 30 years. So we right now have archivists working with WordPerfect files from the 90s. Um, we now have the preservation tools that we didn't have before that were never completed in the original system. So I have much better reporting and auditing tools than I had before. Um, we also have better business object management workflows um, having to do with the legal transfer documents that needed to be created between the agencies and NARA because of the regulations. Those will actually be coming live in 2019. So we're doing this as a phased launch. Um, we'll also start transferring records in fall from the legacy systems. Uh, we aren't allowed by IT security to, to preload them into a system that doesn't have authority to operate. So as soon as we have authority to operate, we can start moving things from the old systems. Um, the tools that we know we don't have yet are good systems for dealing with FOIA, Freedom of Information Act requests. We have a number of different tools, but we don't have one tool that can handle everything. Um, special access requests for presidential records or redaction across all of the systems because we do review and release to, uh, records that sometimes require redaction of things like social security numbers for military personnel records. Um, we also won't yet have our envir parallel environment for classified records. That's almost certainly going to need to be an on-premise system um, unless we can work out details of using something like the CIA AWS system, but we're not quite there yet. So that is my whirlwind. Someone else can take control and do theirs now. Great, so Isabel Meyer from the Smithsonian Institute is up next. Okay, so uh, let me share my screen. 
Uh, oh, someone needs to release their screen, I guess. So it says, like, I can't start my screen share until the other, while the other uh, participant is sharing. So, go it in. so do I... In Zoom, do... you should see down on the bottom or up on the top. Up uh, on the top. Sharing. Pause share or new share? Stop share. There it is. Stop sharing. There, there you go. go. There you go. Sorry. Okay, that's okay. Uh, all right. So can you guys see my screen now? Not yet. Uh, okay, it looks like it's now, like, now you can. There you go. You go. You're good. Okay. All there right. Great. So uh, let me start this lecture. All right. So, um, oops. So a little bit about the Smithsonian. Uh, you know, we're 30 facilities around the world, um, 154 million objects in our collection and specimens. Um, and that's for you know the the objects that are in the museums. That really doesn't include everything that we have because we have a lot, a lot more. Uh, we're still going through a whole, whole inventory. We have over 6,000 staff, 16,000 volunteers, uh, 30 million visitors, um, and a lot of statistics on how we serve the public. So of our collections. Um, you know, there's usually, it's probably less than 1% that's available to the public in the, in the museums at any given time. So part of the Smithsonian strategy is to digitize uh, as much as we can, uh, as quickly as we can uh, to make use of the web and, and other uh, online um, tools to make these uh, items discoverable and available to the public. So, you know, if you think about all the museums that we have, we have you know the Natural History Museum, Art Museum, the Zoo. Uh, we have you know gardens are part of. We have accessioned uh, collections that are actually live uh, gardens. We have an orchid collection. Uh, so the, we have quite a variety of digital content, um, you know, that's being produced and generated across the Smithsonian, which presents you know quite a challenge for preservation. Uh, because each each unit, as we refer to them, is uh, you know sort of their whole their their own operating entity, and um, you know depending upon the type of collections that they have, you know they're going to have they're going to deal with different types of formats and different types of data. Um, we fall under the and, and just a, for clarification, I'm I manage the Smithsonian's digital asset management system which is just really just one component of the Smithsonian's uh, digital ecosystem. And we fall under the office of the Chief Information Officer, which is the technology branch of the uh, Smithsonian. And we play a leading role in the, the development and delivery of what's being called the digital Smithsonian. So within the uh, office of the Chief Information Staff, there's approximately 290 staff members of um, permanent staff and contractors. And within my group, uh, responsible for the digital asset management system, we are a staff of seven. Myself, a systems architect, a developer, a system administrator, one photographer, imaging specialist, and two video um, digital preservation specialists. We're 24 by seven operation. In other words, the system is available to all of our units, um, 24 by seven. Uh, it's housed in our data center, which is in uh, Herndon, Virginia, uh, which is contains over 15,000 square feet of raised flooring with multiple redundant systems. Um, we have battery units and generators and refueling to, you know, to keep the data center running for up to two weeks um, in the event of a disaster. Um, and 24 by 7 real time monitoring, 365 days a year. Uh, so we have a staff that's responsible for keeping track of everything that's going on with the system and with all the servers and all our storage. Uh, quite a big operation. Uh, the Smithsonian network uh, is what sort of keeps all these things together and um, we've been going through a process of upgrading that network because the support of you know digital and being able to move uh, files across. We you know have a high bandwidth a 10 by connection to Internet uh, 2 and Internet 1 service providers. Uh, and all of our facilities on the mall are connected to this um, network and, uh, and a 40 gig connection from there directly to the Herndon Data Center. 
Uh, we support major facilities in Maryland, Virginia, New York, New Jersey, and Panama on this network. And this is sort of what the hodgepodge of it looks like <laughs> to give you an idea of all the pipelines we have coming in and out of the, of the network. So how does this Messina Digital Ecosystem come, like, sort of fit, piece together? Um, and this is one of the challenges that I face all the time is we have a variety of flavors of collection information systems that contain all the metadata on, on our collection. So we have TMS for our art museums. We have EMU for natural history and American Indian. We have SMINZ XG for American history. We have Horizon for our libraries and archives uh, and archive space now. Uh, we have Iris BG for our garden collections. And then we have a whole bunch of other homegrown um, systems and data sets. So all of this architecture is behind our firewall, so none of this is available to the public. It's all, you know, Smithsonian internal only. And then off to the right, you see on this on the slide that the digital asset management system, which is, you know, our um, my my world, and that's where we keep all the images, the audio, and video um, that is associated with a lot of these collections. Again, this is behind the firewall, not available to the public. Uh, in between the two, we have built a bridge. We call it the Collection Dams Integration System. And uh, the Collection Dams Integration System's job is to merge and some of the metadata, descriptive metadata about those collections with the content that's in the, um, in the dams. We also have something that is called the Image Delivery Service that's job is to generate the derivative. So I like to equate the dams sort of to our digital warehouse, just like we have uh, physical warehouses for our artworks and our collections, and those are not available to the public. We go in, you know, we maintain the environment where those collections are housed um, to make sure that, you know, they're preserved. We take things out of those uh, warehouses to um, display to the public. I like to equate the dams sort of in a similar uh, we maintain the environment for our digital uh, collections, and then we take derivatives out of the dams where they become available uh, for use through our uh, set of services for um, discovery by the public and displayed on our, you know, our various websites and uh, kiosks throughout the museum. So at the Smithsonian, we always grapple as to what do we keep. Um, so our largest collection of digital content at the moment is the digital surrogates of our collection objects. Um, this is being generated by all of the collecting museums. We're also starting to acquire a time-based media artworks. These are uh, artworks that are born only only exist in digital format um, that are uh, being acquired by some of the art museums. We have archival collections, we have oral histories, we have artist interviews, educational materials, the Folklife Festival every time, you know, we're getting ready to gear up for this year's uh, Folklife Festival. And all of that uh, content is, flows into the dams. Um, so it keeps us busy quite a bit. This is what the dams um, environment looks like. And now at the Smithsonian, we do have also scientific uh, repository and scientific data, but that is that that does not fall under my um, my domain. So uh, I'm focusing mostly on on the, what I'm responsible for, which is the dam. Uh, we use a product called Open Text Media Manager. Um, we're on version 16. Um, we have you know applications, tours, resource tiers, and service tiers of different servers that serve that application. We have two uh, high availability servers that are like the 24 seven that run the application software. Then along that we have three uh, ingest servers that um, handle all the loading of content. Um, you know, we have it segregated for mass digitization projects and for, you know, the regular day-to-day -day business that, that we get and then AV materials that come in separately. Um, this is all run through an automated process. The, the units can drop their content into hot folders. The system pulls every 15 minutes and loads the content in. 
For our volume and our mass digitization projects, we have built some tools that do um, data integrity checks as things move across the network. So we, for these projects, we make sure that the, there's fixity, that they do a, a, a checksum at the, at the point of creation. Um, as we move that across the network, we validate uh, the checksum when it gets to the other side. Uh, we validate again when we ingest into the dams and then just go through that whole series of checks. Uh, we've also created some tools for the units for auditing purposes. Um, we're going through a process of sort of developing standards as to, you know, for the content that we have, how, when do we audit, what gets, what's eligible for auditing. Uh, for our artworks, we audit, uh, we were doing it every six months. We're now shifted to a year um, basis on that. And we, we, generate reports for all the units on all the activity, anything that's been modified uh, for those artworks and uh, load. We have a preservation section in our metadata for each of our uh, classes of, of assets. Our storage currently is EMC Isilon. So upon ingest to the dams, everything is replicated onto a separate recovery pack, data recovery pack. And at the moment, that that is also, it's a separate cabinet, but it's all in our data center. Um, and then we do nightly uh, backups to a whole, to a Tivoli archive, and then the Tivoli archive, we maintain uh, two uh, tape copies in our data center, and then one goes off site. Um, database uh, for all our metadata is a Oracle 11G. Uh, and then we have a whole host of servers for video streaming and video transcoding and indexing and export and workflow. Um, now I'm talking fast because I know time is, is tight. So um, as I said, we we replicate onto uh, uh, you know storage. Our current storage for the repository itself is 2.7 petabytes. We and we double pretty much double that every year. Um, all of our storage is maintained uh, at our data center. We don't have anything in the cloud at the moment, uh, but we are looking now at possibly using the cloud for um, for our replication and putting you know the the disaster recovery pack in the cloud, and then um, possibly looking at what other types of, of data um, or images or content can we can we offload to the cloud. Um, you know, Isilon, we're very happy with it, but it's expensive. Uh, so we, we've we gone through an evaluation of storage uh, several times now. We've migrated storage three times, and we are currently going through an evaluation again. We're looking at um, Red Hat uh, cluster uh, storage technology. We're looking at DDN, and we're um, Cumulo, which is another vendor. And we're doing benchmarks, and you know we have. I use the uh, the document that NDSA has on the questions to ask for um, preservation, you know, guidelines. So we I give that to the vendors, and they have to answer all those questions. Um, so that's part of the evaluation that we're going through to determine if we stay on our current platform, if we move to something else. Uh, just a little bit of history of the development of the dams, and it was really something that started in 2002 with four units. Uh, we've grown it over the years. Um, in 2008, it was formalized as a supported project with uh, funding and a project manager with me to transition to an enterprise system. Uh, we then uh, moved forward focusing on the enterprise readiness, improving the infrastructure, building up the metadata model, the storage expansion, uh, building standards for our art collection, uh, doing the integration. In 2015, uh, I hired AV Preserve and we did an assessment against the ISO 16363, uh, not to become certified, but to Sort of help us develop a roadmap on uh, and and tell us where we stood within the standard uh, for a TDR. We scored quite well in 
we surpass the technical uh, capabilities, where we fell short was in the documentation that when we're, we're still working on. Um, and uh, 2016, we strengthened metadata and we're building our preservation practices and tools. And we are still working on our strategy and framework. One of the, the challenges is that the Smithsonian does not have a, like an overarching preservation um, guideline. It's sort of each unit does their own. So we're in the process of sort of going through each format for holding that we have, um, that we're responsible for, and then building our, what we think we can support and what we expect the unit to do um, in order to support that. Um, that's, that's what I already talked about was the, the assessment. Uh, this is where we scored, um, out of a possible score of 312, we scored a 262, uh, and our average score was 336. So I was quite pleased with the outcome of that, um, but we will probably go through another assessment uh, in 2020 and go back and look at what have we done since the last assessment, you know, what what are the newer developments in preservation and, you know, what do we need to do to go forward? Um, and I could go on and talk a lot more, but I know we're out of time. <laughs> okay, so um, we had AP Trust next, and I don't know, uh, Nathan, if you want us to keep going. Christian, I don't know if you have any thoughts about whether you'd like to postpone to uh, potentially another meeting, if that's possible. Any thoughts? Um, I'm not sure how long the Zoom session will stay open for because Clear Pre um, sort of schedules them. So it might just sort of cut off at the hour. Um, maybe um, what I might suggest is if Christian could give um, just a, a few minutes and then maybe post a link to a slide deck or um, some other documentation that might be relevant to what you're talking about. I know there's lots of stuff on the AP Trust Wiki um, if people wanted to explore offline. Um, or alternatively, we could try ask Christian back to a future meeting. Hey, Nathan, this is Andrew. If you want, I can give you like a two minute, one slide overview of our infrastructure. Okay, great. Yeah, that's good, Tim. Uh, wait a second. I just need to pick the right thing to share here. All right. Can you guys see this slide? Yep. Okay, so AP Trust is a preservation repository. We don't provide access. Um, and we, uh, we're serving 16 different universities. We uh, do regular fixity checks every 90 days on all the materials that we get. Uh, we record premise events like ingest, uh, deletion, things like that. Um, we store, I'm gonna to go to this slide with our infrastructure. If you look at the left half of the slide, that is our depositors who um, bag materials in uh, bag it format and drop them off in those deposit buckets just above the depositors. Our whole system is on the right side of this slide where we have ingest services that pull bags out of those deposit buckets. Um, we verify uh, the file contents and all the checksums. We store copies of the files in S3 in Virginia and Glacier in Oregon. Our entire system runs on AWS. And then uh, we have a metadata database uh, that allows depositors to see everything that they have in our system. And, see when we've done fixity checks and what premise events have been registered. There's both a web UI and a REST API for depositors to get that material from our database. When, they, when a depositor requests restoration, we reassemble the bag and drop it off in the rest, one of the restoration buckets on the bottom left there, which our depositors have access to. They don't have access to anything over on the right, only except the, the REST API. 
our systems um, have access to the preservation storage area. So we run everything in AWS. Um, we keep a simple web UI, a simple set of metadata. We have a fairly simple, well-defined Bagot format. And we take advantage of one nice feature of AWS storage, which is that we can tag every file that we save with uh, a pretty good amount of metadata, including who owns that file, what bag it came in with, what was its path in the original bag, um, what is its uh, semantic identifier, what is its MD5 checksum, what is its SHA-256 checksum. So if we were to suffer some catastrophe and lose our whole metadata database, we could actually crawl through all of the object storage and reconstruct um, just about everything in the repository. And we can, we can post some other slides online that go into more detail about who we are and what we do, but that's a brief overview of our infrastructure. It's all cloud-based. Great, thank you. Sorry to short shift you. Oh, that's okay. Okay. And, um, I just want to sneak in real quickly. One thing Andrew didn't talk about was uh, Dart, um, which I'm hoping he'll include in some of the materials um, that we can post. Oh, and I see Christian put a note on Dart's a really cool tool that can be used outside of AP Trust for, for uh, bagging and sending content to storage locations. Yeah, NARA may be interested in that, you know, considering the, that they're getting stuff in every format from all different people. Um, this is a distributed, just a tool you can distribute that helps depositors package content with checksums in a known format. Um, so I'll, I'll share some slides on, on Dart and information about where you can get it. Okay, I think, um, Nathan, did you have other things you want to bring up while we're um, the only other little things I had, and we seem to be uh, able to stay on the call here, um, was reminding people about the digital preservation 2018 call for proposals, but I think that is passed. I believe those were due May 15th. Um, and the other is the uh, 2019 storage survey working group proposal. Um, I'm going to try to, uh, there's a link there to that um, document really just as a straw man sort of getting things started. Um, I'll probably try to call a little subgroup meeting for that within the next couple of weeks just to start the initial conversation and talk about what the work is and what it might be entailed. Um, and start to sketch out this proposal a little bit because I think this is something we'd want to run by the NDSA coordinating committee. Um, was there anything else anyone else wanted to bring up? I just want to say that um, we we were hoping to have some time for questions. I apologize that we don't, but I think any of us would be happy to take questions uh, via email. And uh, I think probably we'll all be able to put up our material uh, online for people to see. Lee, do you think people could, you could be a conduit and people could send questions to you and you could gather up the responses to create like a single document of the question and answers so, um, so everyone can take a look at them? Sure, I'd be happy to. Awesome. Thank you so much to all of our presenters today. It was really great um, learning more about uh, some of your, your infrastructure and I had lots of questions in my mind about nitty gritty details, but thank you very much. This is really great to see how everyone else is doing it. It really um, helps to know we're not doing it alone. Um, so if there's, there's nothing else, um, happy Monday. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.